put this between us there. Use our theatrical Exactly. It will work out pretty well here. Okay. All right. Okay. Yeah. Just throw a rock at our heads. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Sure. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So it's all yours. You can go ahead and introduce yourselves. And, uh, I know. It's time travel. <laughs> Big crowd. I'm sure it'll keep, keep getting bigger. It's fiction adventure. What do you want? It's time travel. Look at all those beaming faces. Wasn't it a long, I know. long, long time ago? Thank you all for coming. Huh? Long, long, long time ago. Yeah. In a galaxy <laughs> far, far away. Yes. So if each of you can introduce yourselves to our crowd. And yeah, you... we will do that. Um, my name is uh, is Paul Paul Blake. I, uh, um, <laughs> that's right. I am Paul Blake. I remember now. Um, <laughs> I played a character called Greedo uh, in the very first Star Wars movie when you were all nine or not born. <laughs> and uh, it's a pleasure to be here. So hopefully we'll have a chat a bit later on. I might get you to stand up and do some few bits of stuff that I sometimes do, but uh, maybe not, who knows. Anyway, uh, my friend on the left will also say hello. Uh, hello, I'm C. Andrew Nelson. Uh, I'm an actor, visual effects artist, and animator. And I spent 12 years playing Darth Vader for Lucasfilm. Uh, so you'll find me in the special edition of the original movies as Vader. I'm in the video games like uh, Rebel Assault 2 and Dark Forces that LucasArts produced. I am in a truckload of commercials as Vader, lots of TV show appearances and print ads and <laughs> magazine covers and toy packaging. Um, but I'm also, like I said, a visual effects artist and animator. I spent six years at LucasArts designing and creating games there, and then switched over to Industrial Light and Magic and worked on the effects for the Star Wars prequels and a bunch of other films like Galaxy Quest and Jurassic Park 3 and Perfect Storm and many others. And I also do voices for games and animation and even did Luke Skywalker's voice. So that makes me either my own father or my own son. <laughs> <laughs> and it makes me both her father and her brother. brother. So. My brother, my father, my yes. brother, my brother, my brother. This is about man. So I hand it off to you now. <laughs> Hi, I'm Julie Dolan, and uh, I've been an actress since I was nine. And I started doing voiceovers about maybe 10 years ago and started with commercials, and then landed Princess Leia. So I've been doing Princess Leia since 2010 or 11. My very first Leia job was at Disneyland, um, which is now in Florida and also in Paris and Tokyo. They developed the new Star Tours ride. They revamped it, and now you get holograms that come up. So when you get Princess Leia, that's my voice coming out. So then I got, from that I got hired to do a lot of video games and animation and TV series and things like that. But I still, I was on Gilmore Girls for a while and I've done a bunch of movies and soap operas and after school specials and a lot of stuff on camera. But um, the voiceover is relatively new for me, but you know, getting Princess Leia changed my life. So, that's and for everyone, how's it been the interaction being out here in Stockton so far? Oh, dreadful. They're all it's terrible, oh, terrible okay. people. Awful people. Yeah, awful people. <laughs> yeah. yeah. hate the town. Hate Not the you, people. but people you know. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Jim. Well, I feel yeah. welcome. I don't know about you. <laughs> no, no, no this has been loved. great. This has been great. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I've, I've done Stockton Con several times, and it's always a wonderful show to come to. So thank you all for coming out and seeing yeah. us. Yeah. I've done this area, mm -hmm. like Merced, and, right. but uh, I've never been to Stockton Con. And now you have. Yeah. You can yeah. check that off your yeah. bucket list. Yes, I will. <laughs> I will. Yes. And then we'll go open up some questions uh, throughout the, the panel, and so that might lead to other conversations as well. Who knows? So, yes. uh, if you have a question, just raise your hand, and uh, we can go. We'll go for it right oh. there. So, uh, yeah. Do you guys collect uh, any of Star Wars Funkos? Because there's actually a upcoming Darth Vader one where yeah. it's glow in the dark, but it's from F uh, Return of the Jedi when he's getting shocked by. Oh Amber, wow! Which cool. I have not heard about that. By you when it comes out. Oh sure. Yeah, they're coming out with some new ones from. Oh yeah, from Return of the yeah. Jedi. Yeah. Which is yeah. A nice Lego one. Yeah. That's yeah. Really the good. trouble with collecting Hasbro and Funko stuff is that it's totally addictive. So you people have now walls of uh, yeah 
full has rooms, rooms, and rooms full of the yeah. stuff. So, I mean, it is pretty cool, but it's so addictive. I mean, I, they used to send me stuff uh, every year when mm -hmm. new characters sure. came out. And, um, and it was always going missing because my grandchildren used to steal them every, every time. So I, I'm sure I had a wall full of uh, Darth yeah. Vader's here, but yeah. no longer. So they are, they are incredibly cool toys. A lot different from the merchandise when it first started. I mean, the quality of both the images and the, uh, the drawings and, and the toys and uh, uh, such stuff is so much higher quality than it was yeah. in the early days. But strangely, like everything, the earlier toys are more collectible. Yeah, I still have my, my, my original Greedo. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so, but there is treatment. Yes. Uh, yeah. You can take the pills. Oh, okay, okay, thank I, you. I understand. <laughs> it's a 12 step program, right? <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah, yes. Good, yes. But a good question. Yeah. Thank you. Sir. Uh, for all of you guys, um, when Star Wars first came out, the first movie, especially for you, um, did you know it was going to be this big? Did you, this is my understanding, even us, or like my parents, they didn't even know it was going to be the big, as big as it is now. Yeah. Oh, who like, could have known? Who could have Well, known? yeah. I wasn't in it, so I yeah, was. I wasn't either at that time, but. No. And I'm sure you probably didn't even have an inkling of how. No, all, all of us in the very first one. Um, <laughs> couldn't wait to leave. We really couldn't because we were young, jobbing actors. Yeah. Uh, and we couldn't wait to get on to the next movie because what you've got to remember is in 1976, at Elm Street Studios, where the first movie was made, um, prior to that, the only science fiction films that had been made were all B-movies. So we all thought we were going to be in a B-movie. Yeah. So not much hope there. Until, of course, the movie came out. <laughs> then everything changed. Yeah. Yeah. So the answer to that is no. Yeah, we, I mean, we didn't. And the crew on the first movie mm -hmm. were abysmal to the actors. <laughs> they treated us so badly. They, uh, particularly all um, Harrison and, uh, and Carrie, and particularly Mark, got a really hard time from yeah. some of the crew because they thought it was going to be yet another uh, terrible film which would disappear without trace. But the, the thing that sort of set it apart a little bit was that George was always very, he was always very professional about it. And everybody kind of liked him uh, right from the word go because he was very quiet and not a particularly hands-on director. And, and so there was all that going on. And eventually the crew started to come around and think, actually, this guy knows what he's doing and yeah. started to, uh, to be a lot more proactive, I think, than than they were at first. I'm sure the crew probably thought, listen, we're doing all the work here because we're doing all the special effects. Yeah. And, you know, it's, yeah. it's about us making this movie better. The acting is cheesy and whatever it is. Yeah, you know, exactly. costume characters yeah. and it's, we're, we're the ones that are going to make, yeah. you know what I mean? They yeah, I, I don't even think they cared about that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, I don't even think they cared about that, but I, I know what you mean. Yeah. Right. They were, I mean, they'd all cut. One of the reasons why George did uh, the first three films at uh, Elm Street uh, and Pinewood were because uh, the crews in England at the time were some of the best in the world. Mm -hmm. yeah. And they'd come on from movies like Lawrence of Arabia, uh, the, uh -huh. all the Alec Guinness early stuff, Bridge Over the River Kwai, all those sort of things. So they did have a long pedigree of, of uh, huge professionalism. So I suppose from that point of view, uh, they were difficult to win over. But sure. yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. but they did. They they were eventually won over by George. Even Harrison had such a hard time because um, the guys who lent George the money for the first film really didn't want him and didn't want him even after filming had started. So George was incredibly loyal to keep Harrison there yeah. when everyone else was uh -huh. saying, "Who is this guy? Let's get Tom Selleck. He'll be great." Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, the, the interesting thing is yeah. too that that uh, that uh, Harrison. He came in to read opposite Carrie and Mark and, 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 and yeah. Robbie Benson and all these other people who came in to read for the roles of, of, uh, of the different characters, but he <coughs> wasn't there to read for Han Solo. He was doing a favor for George. That's right, and he yeah. was working at the, the, the story is he was working on a woman's roof yes. as a carpenter in California, and he got the call. Yeah. And she's still waiting for it to be finished, so... Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But you're right, though. George is not a hands-on kind of director. I mean, no. it, it, there's a running gag about how, you know, this is the direction you get from George. More. Bigger. Yeah. That's what we got all the time at ILM. You know, it's like, more. Bigger. But at the same time, 
he's a brilliant director. I mean, you can yeah. say whatever you want about, well, I didn't like this, this storyline, or that I didn't like this character, or I didn't like this dialogue, but when it comes to the visuals, my gosh, he yeah. knows his stuff. Yeah. Uh, at, at ILM, he would constantly, you know, come up with just simple, quick solutions to mm -hmm. things that, you know, we were just racking our brains over trying to get done, mm -hmm. and different shots, and so, but yeah, he, he's not a hands-on kind of guy. He was very quiet and, and unassuming, as I say, but yeah. he could be very witty for a time. So oh, yeah. I remember as a young actor saying to you, playing a green alien on the first day, and I, I was a bit arrogant and uh, had come from working in the theatre a lot and, and doing a little bit for the Royal Shakespeare Company and all that sort of stuff. And I said to George, George, um, how do, you, how do you want me to, how do you see this alien? And he looked at me for about a minute and said, uh, Paul, play it like they do in the movies. <laughs> Which was great advice, I think, as I was in a movie and he was directing it. So I thought that was the best advice I've ever had about how to play a yeah. character. Funny. <laughs> but I understand I'm a theater actor as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. you, you come from what's my motivation, what's, what do I want, right. uh, yes. you know, what am I thinking, what are my goals. Um, how emotionally, where am I? Sure. Like, of course. Yeah. Uh -huh. So I, I get that. Yeah. yeah. That's Absolutely. where I started too with theater. That's, yeah. that's exactly the mindset that you have. Yeah. As opposed I, I, to, I, no, just walk from here to there. <laughs> so, yes. I need to know why I'm walking from here yeah. to there. Yeah. And in the end, what you do is you walk from there to there. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Just yeah. in your own mind. You, know, right. you don't need to, anybody else to tell you how to do yeah. that. Yeah. But thank you. That was, a uh, again, a good question. Thank you. Any well, more for any more? So I had one. For you, Paul, the cantina, like they've tried to replicate it kind of with Maz's castle, and even the sequel and the prequel trilogies, the imperial, you know, ships, everything is nice, polished, yeah, uniform. But that cantina is so unique, even to this day. I agree. Yeah. I, uh, in what? fact, for us, um, I mean, for me, it was forty years ago, so I don't remember. I don't remember what I did last week, let alone what I did forty years ago. So. But I do remember quite vividly that the only real set on Star Wars was the built cantina. Everything else, including the Millennium Falcon, was a painting. Yeah. In fact, the Millennium Falcon was brilliant. It was a ramp that went up between two paintings, and you walked up the ramp and fell off the back. <laughs> that was the Millennium Falcon. But the cantina was so cool because yeah. the booths were real, oh, right. and you could sit in. And uh, the lighting, we had a great lighting camera and a head of lighting guy. And lit it brilliantly. Your Taylor? Yeah, yeah. 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 And and the uh, the smoke effects and all the little aliens, whether they were puppets or uh, small people or actors mm -hmm. sitting in the other booths, were fascinating to look right. at. So we actually went and sat around while they were filming other stuff because that was such a, a, a cool thing. And and I think that was one of the things that sort of made me think, oh, maybe this movie isn't going to be uh, uh, the attack of the killer to Mars. <laughs> There's also there's a there's a grittiness to that cantina that 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 makes it feel real. I think that's something that that is in that first film. That sort of that grittiness. That sort of everything is is sort of lived in. This is a real world with dust and dirt yeah. and everything. And yeah. I don't think you get that with with the you know what you were talking about uh, in in Force Awakens. Right. That uh, you know it just seems a little too designed. Yeah. It was very weird. I was at a convention about three weeks ago, a month ago. Uh, somewhere up north in the UK, and they had built a replica cantina. So I was sitting in the exact same oh booth I'd been sitting in 40 <laughs> years previously. Uh -huh. Flashbacks. Which was, yeah, it was kind of strange flashbacks. But, but I think that's, that's true. It was fairly gritty and, yeah. and real. Yeah. Yes, sir. Well, let's continue on with the cantina. How did you feel when they tried to retcon that uh, you shot first? Uh, yeah. <laughs> that's a nice way of saying who shot first. Yeah. Well, really, yeah. I saw the movie. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, I think everybody has an opinion, basically. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and kind of like everyone else, I, I liked the original script um, because it made a little more sense about Han Solo and what kind of guy he was. And, mm -hmm. and George was very adamant about those scenes being a cowboy a homage really yeah. to yeah. to the classic cowboy films and it, it was classic you know the guy comes in and i thought george's excuse or reason for the uh, changing it three times the final one was that he wanted 
Han Solo to be much more like John Wayne was in his cowboy films. And the thing that set him apart was the fact that he always gave the bad guy the chance to go for his gun and right. then the gunfight yeah. occurs. And he wanted it to be a bit more like that. So, uh, yeah, I'm kind of with the early days of Han shot yeah. first. Yeah. They, they went through so many versions of that too. That there's, there's a lot of problems from a technical standpoint with that shot and trying to make Han shoot you know, first. There are, is that, or that, 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 he's, that, he's, that he's doing you know, this in self-defense or something or whatever. It, you know, they're, they're doing all kinds of, you don't see Harrison Ford react to the, the, the gunfire mm -hmm. or anything like that. You don't, you, and, and it, they, they did it so many times and it, 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 I think they would they, like, four or five or six different versions of it before they actually released it in the special edition. And I saw the earlier ones and no, yes. they, were, they were even worse. But uh, but yeah, I don't think I don't think it needed to be done because what you do when you when you change that scene is you you actually um, you rob Han Solo of his character arc. Mm -hmm. He starts off as someone who who uh, that you you figure if it comes down to it, you know, if it's, hey, him or Chewie, well, goodbye, Chewie, you know, so, <laughs> you know, that's the way he is in the first film, and then when you get to Return of the Jedi, he cares nothing about himself, and it's everybody else, he's completely self-sacrificing, so you have this wonderful character arc, but that little change, made a changes huge difference, that, makes a huge yeah. difference, yeah. yeah. Of course, what happened in the early days was that everybody, George and the, the entire crew, were thinking on their feet, 24 hours a day, second by second, because they had no idea how to shoot any of the movie at the start <laughs> of filming. Uh, there were very few storyboards. I mean, they were storyboards, but because it involves so much mm -hmm. uh, at a time when nothing existed to make it exist, because George right. invented industrial light sure. and magic to, uh, to get all those special effects put in onto the first movie, yeah. um, is that everyone thought on their feet so much, so all the special effects and things that happened, happened in real time and for real. So when it came to my little bit and, and to how they were gonna kill me, I thought, well, how are they gonna kill me? And then they said, well, of course, nobody's gonna shoot. It's gonna be a dummy that we're gonna stick in your seat. And then we're gonna fill it full of explosives and <laughs> blow it up and then you will die that way. And I thought, oh, that sounds cool, okay. <laughs> so we did the scene up until the point of uh, that point. Uh -huh. And then I got out of the chair, they put the dummy in the chair the Jelly Knight Man. In the early days, you yes. always had a guy on a movie right. called the Jelly Knight Man because he was the guy who loved blowing things up. Yep. Fill the dummy <laughs> full of explosives. Action, the dummy splattered the entire <laughs> studio. It was everywhere, nearly set the flat on fire. I mean, it was so much of uh, chaos everywhere. And then they said, okay, we'll think again. So the Jelly Knight Man filled the dummy, a new dummy, with less explosives. <laughs> well, at least they uh, had another dummy. At least they had yeah. two yeah. dummies, yeah. which they were lucky to yeah. have. Right. Normally yes. they were going to go with the one. Right. And two costumes. And yes. they put the only other costume they had on the second dummy, blew it up. It blew it up okay this time, so it didn't completely obliterate. But they wrap, grabbed the costume off the dummy on fire and put it on me, still smoking. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> and then poured acid on the back of the dummy to make it flare up yeah, with yeah. smoke. Well, I mean, actors are cheap, you know. Sure. Penny, you know, they could have got another one of me instantaneously, yeah. so they didn't care. You would have been the third one. Yeah, exactly, yeah. yeah. So that's how on your feet mm -hmm. movies were in those yeah. days. Much more considered these days, obviously health and safety. Sure. Sure a huge difference to a lot of stuff. But yeah. in those days, uh, some of the other movies I did, you would always have to say, well, you do it first. Mm -hmm. Because it was so dangerous, you know, right. so. But yeah. That's why they have stunt coordinators. My husband's a stunt man. Oh, so right, right, of course. They, there's yeah. always safety, safety yeah. first. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And the stunt coordinator will sometimes do the trick first or the to show the artists yeah uh -huh. yeah yeah of course and then they have stunt doubles my husband doubles a lot of people because you have an, yeah. and he also is an actor so he can act and he and, can fall down and do right. the falling yeah. Yeah. yeah i could do none of that but after, <laughs> after the whole twilight zone thing that's when they started yeah you know going yes. yeah, yeah we need to have a safety yeah. on set yeah so, right yeah yeah but great question who else has a good question here yes sir uh, 
I know you guys, none of the Star Wars people like talking about it, but what about the Christmas special? <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll address that one. I'll address this one. It's the, the Star Wars holiday special. Well, the thing is, you cannot blame... Yes, you cannot blame George Lucas for that. That was a 20th Century Fox thing. Fox, if you have to remember, is that Fox owned the first film. Okay, George owned technically everything in it, but George, but Fox owned the first film, and they contractually were able to do this monstrosity called the Star Wars Holiday Special. And please, if you see Peter Mayhew, don't ask him about this. <laughs> okay, it is a really touchy subject for him. Um, but uh, it's, 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 it's awful. It's just absolutely awful. It's one, it's one of the worst things ever made, I think. Wasn't it supposed to keep everybody on suspense for the next movie? Because it was like... Yeah, it was, it was supposed to... Yeah, the idea was at that point they, that, you know, they, Fox and Lucasfilm knew that they were going to be making another movie. You know, they were going to make Empire Strikes Back. And <laughs> Fox wanted to keep Star Wars fresh in everybody's minds and everything like that, so they sense. made this special. Um, but... I don't know what they were smoking when they made this. <laughs> it's it's just really awful. I think and if you're if you're looking for a reason, yes, uh, the only thing I could come up with is that they were as excited as you were with yeah. their success. Uh -huh. They yeah. couldn't believe how yeah. successful mm -hmm. it was starting to become, mm -hmm. and therefore it was like a bunch of kids really given a, a, a bag of sweets yes. and, uh, and really thinking, my God, I've got the best bag of sweets in the world. Here. Right, and then they ate the whole thing. And then they yeah. ate the whole thing, yes. yeah. So that's the uh -huh. only mild excuse I can think right. of for it. But. but, and also, if you ever want to see it, there is one way to watch it. The guys from Mystery Science Theater, uh, <laughs> Mike, Mike Nelson, Bill Corbett, and Kevin Murphy, they have a thing called Rift Tracks. There is a Rift Tracks version of the Star Wars Holiday Special. It is hysterical. <laughs> but I tried to give a copy of it to Peter, and he, he, he turned it down. He just said, I still can't watch it. No, even under, under those conditions. So. And you see, it wasn't that bad. Yeah, it was. I liked it. <laughs> it was horrible. Don't you lie to know. everybody. I mean, you were three years old watching that movie. How old were you? When I first watched it, I feel like three or four. Well, oh, then it was great oh, yeah. then. Yeah. 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 It was a perfect movie. Yeah. It was cool. Watch it again now. It's awful. <laughs> It's an absolute monstrosity. And you said, where were they smoking? Yes. It was the 70s, and it was a lot of cocaine. I <laughs> imagine so. <laughs> Probably a lot of cocaine. Yeah. It had to yeah. be. And Julie, to talk about your, 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 your hearing these stories. Oh, I'm that, enjoying all this. Right, no, I know. <laughs> yeah. I like, this is before my time. Right, and now talk, my... talking about before your time, now entering a world where you knew the popularity, yeah. and you knew that the fan base, and talk about what surprised you, even though you knew the world, but now really being the world. Well, when I first got the job of Leia, I knew the responsibility that I had, and I wasn't a, like, Star Wars fan fan. Of course, I'd seen the movie, the first three. I think that's all I saw was the first three. And uh, I realized I need to go back and rewatch these, and I need to study her, and I need to study a Wikipedia, Wikipedia on Leia, so I could learn who she was and what her goals were and who her parents were and where she came from and, and what she wanted out of life. And I went to Hawaii for a vacation. I bought all six movies. There's only six at the time. All six movies and I sat in my hotel room and watched movie after movie after movie after movie just so I could learn and become her. You know, So I, I, I knew the homework I had to do and I knew the responsibility that I had because as soon as I did Rebels, and even as soon as I did the, the uh, Disneyland, the Star Tours, uh, I would meet fans that that think I know everything there is to know about Star Wars. And I was yeah. like, oh my god, I don't know the answer to that. So I realized I had to do a lot of research. You know, and I still don't know everything. I know the little world that I had to be in. Um, but yeah, there's it, it, it's a big family. The Star Wars family is just amazing. Yeah. I feel like I have family all over the world. It's great. And she is brilliant as Leia. I mean, she really is. No, I, I mean it. I mean it. No, as one voice I to another, I really mean that. It's like, no, she's very, very impressive. Most impressive. It's my theater training, actually. Yes. Oh, what kind of mindset do you have to get into, Julie, to be knowing that you have a response? That's a responsibility. Yeah, it's kind of scary. Yeah. However, when we did Rebels, you know, I, I, they, I tried to watch Leia's movements 
uh, in A New Hope and in, in, in different movies that she was in, just so I could feel like her physically and the way she talked and her voice. And Dave Filoni, who directed it, said to me, you already got the job. You don't need to try to act like her or sound like her. We need you to sound like you because you already sound like her anyway. So, uh, you know, I did all that research and then I, as they say in acting, you, you know, just do, do all of your research, make all of your choices, and then when you get on set, forget it because it's already in your system. You know, and you just have to be in the moment. So yeah, it was, it was I, I didn't realize the responsibility that I had at first. I was like, oh, this is just another job. My agent called me and said, can you sound like Princess Leia? No, I don't think so. I haven't heard that voice. So they sent me the Obi-Wan Kenobi speech, you know, the General Kenobi, years ago you served my father in the Clone Wars, that speech. And they said, try to sound like this, and then record it and send it to us. So I did, and I went, I, I guess it sounds like it, I don't know. But there was 200 other girls that did the same thing. And they didn't find anybody, and then they brought in Carrie Fisher. She certainly didn't sound like herself in any way because her voice was a lot deeper. And then they brought in another 200 girls, and I was one of those 200. And this is, this is for Disneyland. And it was between me and another girl, and they brought us into Disney Imagineering. And I stepped into the studio, and there was a hologram of, from A New Hope. It was her hologram. But as I'm saying the words, they manipulated the mouth. They're so amazing. Yeah. And it was my voice coming out of her mouth. And I was like, oh, this is, this is freaky. Yeah. And I said, is that me or is that her? And they said, no, that was you. So then two weeks later, I found out I got the job. And then it just, things just kept going from there. And that's when I went, okay, I gotta get serious about this. If they're gonna keep booking me, I need to know my stuff and I need to know who I'm playing. You know, and I need to watch the movies. And I need to, you know, so, yeah. Questions <laughs> out there? We keep going, we got about, about 10 more minutes, 12 more minutes. Yeah. Right. So don't lose uh, your chance. Uh, so we've got to happen. Two costumes, first time you put them on, what was that like? Vader costume? Vader, Vito, okay, I guess. Um, Basketball. Beverly Hills Cop. The Beverly Hills Cop. What was it like putting on the costume the first time? And, you know, what was it? The first, the first time I put on the first time I put on the Vader costume, I had to try it on just to see if it fit up at Skywalker Ranch, and um, it was kind of claustrophobic. It was. It was yep. very claustrophobic. Very. If you unnerving. don't know how to get out of something. Yeah. When I was in costume, I had to know where's the you know the, the Velcro. Where if oh, I yeah. pan, have a panic attack, yeah. where I need to be able to reach it myself. So they would always yeah. teach me where to get out of it, where to pull the head out, because you can only see like for basketball, I could just see out of the mouth, you know. And uh -huh. you are you're oh, yeah. exerting a lot of energy, and there's not a lot of air in there. So I remember I was passing out a couple times because oh, sure. of the heat. Yeah. You know, so you have to be able to know how you can get out of it so you don't panic. God forbid you panic in there. Nobody right. can tell because you look like you're, you know, having a good time. Yeah. And you're freaking out and people don't know. Of course, if Vader goes like this, it kind of <laughs> throws things <laughs> off. He's a wild, <laughs> crazy guy. <laughs> but uh, the, uh, the the Vader costume, it was it was a little disorienting the first time I put it on. Uh, because the visibility is, 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 like you were saying, visibility is not great. You know, you can see basically what's directly in front of you through the lenses of the mask or through the bottom of the breast screen, you can see your feet and that's it. It's not the worst, I'd say 3PO is probably the worst. But didn't you have an yeah. experience where you almost teetered off something? Oh yeah, oh yeah, I almost fell off of platforms, I almost, I, I was caught on fire once. Uh, there's a lot of different things where, yeah, I, I, cause you can't tell, you have to just kind of, a lot of times, for things that you were shooting, you would have to do muscle memory to know how many steps can I take. You rehearse it without the head on for a while, and then you put the head on, and you just kind of, okay, well, how many steps can I take? How far do I go left or right? Don't fall off the platform. Don't fall, you know, don't, you know, hit your head on something, anything like that. But, uh, and it's, it's an interesting costume to put on because when you put on the Vader costume, it's 17 pieces if you include the lightsaber that hangs off of the belt. And you put it on very, very slowly because you want everything to look just right and all the things lined up perfectly so it looks good. And uh, the last thing you do is you put on the mask, which is open in back and goes straight on this way and Velcros across the back of the head and then the helmet that comes back down and it, uh, you know, it Velcros to the front of the, of the mask. But the interesting thing is, is like if you catch a glimpse of yourself in the mirror, you don't think to yourself, you know, hey, there I am in the Vader costume. You think, there's Darth Vader. <laughs> and you walk differently and you move differently and it's like and I've always been a costume kind of actor anyway it's like I get a lot from the costume 
that I wear. This is why I love cosplay too. I love seeing cosplayers. It's like I love costumes, and uh, but that one, yeah, it was a little disorienting at first, and then you you, you kind of get used to it after a while. And you learn how to walk up and down stairs when you can't see what you're doing and and stuff like that. The, the, the worst one was I was doing a Taco Bell commercial one time and they wanted me to walk down a staircase, which is hard enough to do. And it was me and six stormtroopers. They wanted me, they wanted us to walk down a staircase and they had um, dry ice coming down from above and a steam tray underneath us. Mm. And as soon as you walked in front of that steam tray, the lenses of the mask all fog over. You can't see a darn thing, so. Yeah. It's interesting what you say because mm -hmm being so much earlier than, right. than, than those bits. I, I'm amazed at how similar <laughs> it was. I think thing, things would have moved on, but I remember, I don't remember much about it, but the mask I do remember is the only thing you could see was actually your feet. Yeah. I, you, you couldn't see anything out of the eyes or, or the mouth. Sure. But, and like you, I remember having to count the steps to when I sat down. <laughs> sure. And that was yeah. the only way I could avoid bumping into the furniture. Sure, because you, you can't know. see where you're going. Yeah. Because yeah. you couldn't see where you were going. So things didn't change. No. That much, which I thought they would have done. I mean, obviously, the things that have changed are the animatronics, which are now inside all costumes, mm -hmm. where you get a fan and a temperature control on some costumes. Sure. In our day, <laughs> I never got a fan in the Vader We costume. were lucky to get, you know. Oh, yeah. I mean, I had what was called a live mask, which is how they did it years ago, which they put plaster of Paris on the front of your face mm -hmm. and on the back, right. joined it up, poured in um, oh. an India rubber solution, which then right. was the shape of your head and it flashed right. about here mm -hmm. and then they would hand that mask over to the um, modelers and the uh, designers and they would come up with a character whatever they decided on with uh, the production uh, crew or George or whoever mm -hmm. and that's how they used to do it but of course masks as indeed costumes are so much more sophisticated now in that most of it is built up from the body and outwards mm -hmm. and you'll be in it for five six seven eight hours and it'll take you four hours of the, in the early hours of the morning and two to take off so just being able to do that right yeah. <laughs> in you know, the old days was very sure different. yeah the last uh, costume job i did i thought i hung up my costume years ago after basketball i mean after uh, beverly hills cop but i booked a national kia commercial a car commercial mm -hmm. and remember they used to have the hamsters the hamsters yes so two years ago or a year ago they had um, a musical version and they and i play p keyboards and guitar so they hired musicians and i didn't realize I was going to be a hamster. I thought, oh, I'm going to be playing guitar with a hamster. And when it, I got the contract, it said guitar hamster. And my agent said, no, 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 you are the hamster. So there was about five of us, and we all played instruments. Um, but the, the costume was a big, furry hamster, but the head was an open helmet because it was all CGI. Right. And they had points on us, yeah. so if I would wink or if I would open my mouth that and sing, show. they could follow that. Right. And uh, so I, it was so much easier, because I, th I thought, oh my god, I'm going to be in a, in a hamster helmet yes. and not be able to breathe, but it was all open, so we were, be able, we were able to be in it for hours. Right. On your CV, does that say hamster? Yes. <laughs> yes. Great. Kitar hamster. So we all <laughs> suffer for our art for your benefit. Yeah. 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 So a couple more questions. Somebody had. Yeah. Lady at the back. Hi. Hello. I'm a former cast member at Disneyland. I'm Yay. Yay. Oh. Yeah. That's, that's awesome. Yay. So I heard your voice a lot. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> I was just wondering if you guys are planning to develop the edge at all, or what's your opinion? Not this year. Not this year. It's going to be crazy. Yeah. It's going to be like 200,000 people there or something. Yeah. No, I would love to see I'm that. I'm hoping to work there. Yeah, I know. That'd be great. Yeah. Yeah. Me. <laughs> I know. Actually, one of our cohorts, uh, Mike Quinn, is actually in. Oh, yeah, Mike's uh, doing He's in, the, I think, the, uh, the Millennium Falcon ride. So, yeah. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. I haven't even seen um, the Harry Potter world at Universal. It's I haven't right either. down the street from my house. My husband works at Universal, so. <laughs> you have no so excuse then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yes. yes. But, One more uh, question. Uh, Last question. Anyone? So come you on. can come check you out. You're, you guys can go upstairs. back. Right. We're upstairs. Yeah. Come back and say hi. Listen, thank you all so much. Yeah, we didn't get a chance awesome. to make you stand up. <laughs>